Uh, my name is uh, Yiling Wang. I'm currently a junior professor at the uh, IHES. And uh, I grew up in China. I moved to France when I, when I was uh, 18. And then most of my studies happened in France and then in Switzerland for my PhD. Then I also lived for three years in the United States for my postdoc. And now I'm back in France at the IGS. So I, I consider myself as a, um, a world citizen, I would say. So I'm also very interested in knowing more cultures and uh, to try to experience uh, different types of life and uh, yeah, that's me. Actually with math, um, I never really experienced a lot of enthusiasm when I was a kid. Also, maybe also at that time I probably don't know what math exactly is. And it's more about computation and uh, solving problems in schools and uh, but maybe one instance I now can think of is uh, when I was a kid, I really liked those um, soap bubbles and where you can just dip into the bottle and then blow it. You, you see all those colorful bubbles. I, I really enjoyed that. And um, I remember there was a moment I thought about why these bubbles are just so round and why they're all round. And I asked my parents, and I was thinking about this. I'm kind of find this amazing. They're beautiful, and my parents uh, told me that because this is the surface which has the smallest area uh, for a given volume that is inside. At that time, I'm, I was really amazed by this, and also I didn't know this is actually something about mathematics. But I was just uh, amazed about how people can show by pure logic that proving something like this, and also how nature also managed to follow this type of rules that uh, mathematics. And I think to me that later when I become a mathematician, I kind of can trace back my passion for math. It's never really knowing that this is math, but it's rather about all kinds of curiosity that I had. And I keep asking all kinds of questions and math ended up giving me a satisfactory answer. And that's also maybe the reason I have followed math uh, in my higher education and I felt like math is the subject that allows me to pursue my questions till the very end of it and it's a subject where I am allowed to ask all the whys and hows without someone telling me that that's enough but you don't have to ask more yeah I, it's, it's, it's really calm in the hindsight. I never know like actually really like math, only when I get in touch to this uh, higher education, the math in higher education in university, then I realize, oh, actually this is the thing I liked. Mm. Mm, I grew up in China, in Shanghai, and my parents, they are, none of them are academics. I, I know no one who are academics. But my uh, mom, she's an architect. My dad, he works also in the management. And it's, um, I would say it's a family being very supportive. Although the bigger environment of uh, um, the whole academic uh, situation in China is very competitive. But my family has been always very supportive and they didn't spend much time like other Chinese parents to help me to, in schools, to succeed in schools. But I have my parents who are good role models. Like uh, my mom would tell me that she was actually the first in class in physics course. 
she actually wasn't very good in maths, but she never said that. But she told me, oh, she was the first in class when she was at school in physics. And maybe that's why I never thought that girls has any diff difficult, would have any difficulty in STEM. This never has crossed my mind because my mom, she was the best in the class. And um, so my parents, they just show me they, how hardworking they are. And they're really trying to excel in everything they're doing. So this is the, also I, I think my family is also very good at like protecting me from all the um, other people's opinions, like for instance, there was sometimes opinions about girls shouldn't be pursuing uh, academic success, or girls shouldn't be doing STEM, and they would never let this voice reach me. So I never heard of that. Like I, this is uh, only when I got to know this inequality. Only when I move abroad, like uh, people, it's a topic that people do talk a lot about. But when I grew up, I never heard of that. Mm. I think math, I never know that it can be a job until I enter Ecole Normale. And I also didn't know how doing math would be like at all, even if I don't know the job existed. But it actually happens gradually. It's not, never a moment that I decide this is what I want, this is my goal. Um, it just, when I Try, I enjoy the time when I think about math and I enjoy being around people who are also enthusiastic about math. I enjoy the moments in the math class. I enjoy the time where I can ask all the questions to myself and finding an answer. And if the answer is not satisfactory, I will continue seeking answers. And uh, it's in this process, in this process, slow, slowly, that I realized that math is the subject which really fits the best the way I'm thinking, and also gives me the much, the most, the freedom in pursuing uh, my questions that many people would consider. Why you even bother to think about this? Uh, so at the time when maybe the moment when I get to decide enter which schools after, after class preparatoire, so there's the competition thing, concours uh, in France, that you can choose between engineering schools and uh, or Ecole Normale, where Ecole Normale will be much more oriented to research. At that time, I even didn't know mass mathematician can be a job, but I chose Ecole Normale just because I like their questions on the exams, it really seeking understanding, not just about applications and really the deep reasons, you can keep asking the deep reason behind everything. Um, so that was a very natural choice to go to Ecole Normale for me. I was lucky enough to enter as well. And then at Ecole Normale, I get to know more the advanced mathematics and know it's a possible career, and then I pursued this, this path. Yeah, I remember the first theorem, really the first theorem that I proved myself, and it also ended up becoming my first paper. Um, that was uh, something about the Lerner energy uh, passing through something called the reversibility of the Lerner energy. Basically, we associate uh, a number to some Jordan curve, a curve, and uh, we want to show that this number is uh, invariant under some transformation, uh, basically interchanging the direction, the curve. And I remember the way I come up with the strategy is that first to look at the energy passing through one point, I figured it out very quickly. I'm very confident about myself after doing this. But then I would say, let's do it for two points. 
the second easiest case. But I couldn't do it. I still couldn't do it now. And at that time, so I was thinking maybe my hope originally was that you do one point, then you do two point, then you do three point, then you do n points, and then you do infinitely many points. So the curve will go through all these points and it ended up telling you everything about the curve and then I will be down. But then I was stuck at the place where there are two points. I can't do it. And then I was stuck for a long time and I was running one day and suddenly had the idea of, um, actually I don't need to do the two points. I can do immediately infinitely many points. It's actually easier than two points. But this thing also, it was so natural before is that saying doing one point, after doing one point I would do two points but never really try to think, like jump way ahead, like beyond everything I could imagine. But, but that way, I don't know why when I was running at that time, I was thinking, well, why not let me just directly do this infinitely many points? And it turned out it worked. And I, while I was running, I don't have any pen, I, don't, um, I can't write it down. And when I have this idea, like I quickly try to finish it, like uh, quickly in my mind, I think, okay, this is probably going to work. When I was running, I definitely slow down much more. But when I think, okay, this might really work, I rushed back and tried to write things down and check a few things. You only feel a bit more uh, reassured when you have written down something. And it seems it worked. And this proof still worked in the end. It's how it was published in the end. Um, although there are more technical things. But that moment when I just rushed down, I just say, I can drop everything. I just want to know whether it's true or not. And that's, I think, one thing is really, really nice is that you, when you, I can't write it down, I have to hold it in my mind. When I have to hold it in my mind, it has to be very intuitive. It can't be complicated. It can't be a lot of um, difficult computation. I, or I need to have some intuitive idea why it should work. But it really helps that I can't write. So that I have to make this argument as simple as possible in order to hold it in my mind. And it ended up being most mainly all the time of my ways of thinking of doing math. I still remember this Eureka moment. I remember how um, happy I was, this ecstasia of uh, this, this moment. It's, it's just so memorable. And also this also helped me to encourage me or like set the tone of my future research. I want the thing to be as simple as possible and it must be elegant. I must have to hold it in my mind. And then I walk when I think I, I, I walk while thinking sometimes so that my mind winds off, still keep the simplicity. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, also a very important moment indeed for me. Especially from my own experience, I do feel like the curiosity, if you have it, it's a very precious thing and uh, you should try your best to protect it. And there might be voices who tell you that you shouldn't pursue this or you may have doubts about whether you are good you would be good or doing this or that or whether you fit into other people's uh, preset image about what mathematicians are like. Uh, they, they, these, all these things can kill your curiosity because you care about things outside of math itself or even other subject, doesn't have to be math. It, I, I feel like curiosity is really a precious thing that you should do your best to protect it 
and shield off all the other voices. And I think I'm lucky enough that my curiosity was protected by my parents when I was young. And when, if you don't have this um, condition, that you would need to try your best to not listen too much of other voices, but listen to your own heart. Yeah.